Hello, good morning. This is BBC News with the latest headlines. The Prime Minister is expected to announce more ministerial appointments in the biggest shake-up of his government since he entered Downing Street. Britain, the United States and Australia agree a new defence and security partnership to counter China's growing military presence. China is embarking on one of the biggest military spends and military uh, investment uh, in history. It is growing its Navy, Air Force at a huge rate. Today is the deadline for care staff or volunteers who work in residential and nursing homes in England to have their first dose of the COVID vaccine. Are you a care home worker or someone who lives in a care home or with a relative in one? Let me know if you think it's right or not that it's mandatory for care home staff to be fully vaccinated. On Twitter, that's at Anita underscore McVeigh and use the hashtag BBC Your Questions. And most workers say they'd rather not return to their offices full time, according to new research. And over a fifth would like to work from home for good. Also coming up this hour, out of this world, four amateur astronauts, including a billionaire, will spend the next three days circling the Earth in the latest milestone for space tourism. Hello and welcome to BBC News this morning. After a ruthless day of firing and hiring, the Prime Minister is set to continue the biggest shake-up of his government since he entered Downing Street. Yesterday, he fired his education, justice and housing secretaries and demoted others as he reshapes his senior team. Dominic Raab is no longer Foreign Secretary. He's now Justice Secretary and Deputy Prime Minister, with Liz Truss becoming only the second woman in history to hold the post of Foreign Secretary. Gavin Williamson, widely criticised for his handling of schools examinations in England, has been sacked as Education Secretary and leaves the government. And Mr Williamson has been replaced by the former Vaccines Minister, Nadim Zahawi. Boris Johnson has promised that his new cabinet will work tirelessly to unite the country, as our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. Have you still got a job, sir? There were hirings, firings and some eye-catching moves as over several hours in Westminster, Boris Johnson assembled his updated team of senior ministers. The biggest promotion went to Liz Truss, now the second ever female foreign secretary. Well, the prime minister has put in place a strong and united team uh, which is going to deliver for the United Kingdom. We're determined to deliver on the people's priorities and help level up the country. Dominic Raab, criticised recently for staying on holiday in Greece while Kabul fell, was moved down from the Foreign Office to become Justice Secretary. But he was also formally made Deputy Prime Minister, a title not given out since 2015. It was a good day for former health ministers. Are you happy with that? Are you happy? Nadine Dorries, very happy to be the new culture secretary. Also smiling, Nadim Zahawi, who led the vaccine rollout, now in charge of education. The former education secretary, Gavin Williamson, was among those to be sacked from the government completely. A widely expected move after he was heavily criticised for his handling of exams and schools during the pandemic. And Michael Gove, a minister known for getting things done, replaced Robert Jenrick at Housing and Communities, a department that will play a key role in the levelling up promise. Boris Johnson has said he wants to get on with the job, but there are a few more roles to fill first. Helen Catt, BBC News, Westminster. Mo Hussein was a former special advisor to Amber Rudd as UK Home Secretary and former Number 10 Downing Street Chief Press Officer under David Cameron, and he joins me now. Morning to you, Mo. Thanks for your time Good today. Uh, it was interesting to listen to Liz Truss in that particular clip, wasn't it? She managed to get all of Boris Johnson's key phrases into that soundbite, deliver for the UK people's priorities, uh, yeah. level up the country. Looking at the big picture, first of all, what do you think this reshuffle so far tells us about Boris Johnson's plans and intentions? 
I think this is about the Prime Minister wanting to really focus now on the post-COVID recovery uh, and get, get back to his domestic reform agenda. The last reshuffle was over 18 months ago, so we were all still talking about Brexit a lot more than we are now, and that was the cabinet he needed at the time. Since then, the world has changed dramatically, and because of the pandemic, there's a lot more work to be done to get us out of the situation we find ourselves in and to get back on the things that he promised the electorate uh, at the 2019 elections. So I think the calculation is he needs reformers, he needs people who have slightly higher energy and can grip some of the big challenges, and he needs those people on the pitch now uh, to deliver because uh, he's got one eye on the next election. Uh, absolutely, and on that front, he always talks about levelling up, doesn't he? But it, has his cabinet been levelled up? I think about 70% of the cabinet uh, attended fee-paying schools. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. When we talk about uh, having a cabinet that reflects the country, of course, there is gender, there is race. And I think on both those counts, uh, it's a really good cabinet uh, and it's a really representative cabinet. But you have to also look at things like you just said, what kind of schools did people go to? Did they go to university? Did they not go to university? Which part of the country are they from? If levelling up is to have real meaning and people to really understand what it means for them and their families and their lives, particularly over the next couple of years where the Prime Minister does have to deliver on commitments made, then I think having people who can understand these communities, who represent these communities and have a voice at the table is really, really important. Uh, let's look at a couple of the specific hirings of, and firings, uh, Mo. Defence Minister Ben Wallace asked about Dominic Raab this morning, tried to frame this purely as a move rather than a demotion. But it's undeniable that what is traditionally called one of the great offices of state, uh, the Foreign Office, is is no longer his. Correct. I think you have to call a spade a spade. It very much is a demotion. That's not to belittle the work in the Ministry of Justice. There is a lot of work to be done on prison reform, on courts backlog, uh, on the legislature in general. But uh, going from the Foreign Office, one of the big offices of state, to that, um, even if you have added in the office of the Deputy Prime Minister, which we haven't heard for a while, and let's see what it actually means in practice, uh, it is, I'm afraid, a demotion, yes. And it's been really interesting looking at social media this morning in reaction to Nadine uh, Doris, her appointment as culture secretary. Um, it, it seems a bit marmite. People might either love her in that role or hate her in that in that role. Correct. But I think, again, this is a deliberate strategy. The government is also keen to pursue uh, its agenda, particularly on, as it would call it, perhaps the war on woke, or if you look at things like uh, what she said already about the, the big things in her intro, not least the BBC, I'm afraid to say, um, then I think it wants to have these conversations and the government wants to have these debates because it resonates with some of its key voters. But the, the key takeaway from any reshuffle is the Prime Minister is very powerful when he, when he does one. You can only play this card every once in a while, not very often. But just because you've changed the faces and changed the people, the challenges the government faces still remain the same. Same. A lot of these uh, new ministers will have to have conversations with the Treasury, for example, about the upcoming spending review, and perhaps in some cases may try and get more money than their predecessors did, particularly looking at education and, and the slight shortfall there is there in terms of catch-up funding. Whether they are successful or not is another question. So uh, let's see. Yes, you've got these reformers, but will they be allowed to reform? Will they be allowed to perform and do what they want to do uh, is, I think, what we need to wait and see. OK. Uh, Mo Hussain, very good to get your thoughts this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. The UK, the US and Australia have launched a new security partnership with plans to develop a fleet of nuclear-powered submarines. Boris Johnson says the project will be crucial for the protection of their shared interests in the Indo-Pacific region. But China has accused them of having a Cold War mentality. Our defence correspondent Jonathan Beale reports. Britain's decision to send its aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth and other warships to the Pacific is proof of the growing strategic importance of the region. The UK, US and Australia are all increasingly concerned about a more assertive China. Hence the decision to step up their military cooperation and important enough for the leaders of all three countries to announce this new defence partnership, AUKUS for short. The UK, Australia 
and the US will be joined even more closely together, reflecting the measure of trust between us, the depth of our friendship and the enduring strength of our shared values of freedom and democracy. We need to be able to address both the current strategic environment in the region and how it may evolve. Because the future of each of our nations, and indeed the world, depends on a free and open Indo-Pacific enduring and flourishing in the decades ahead. As a start, Britain and America will help Australia build a new fleet of nuclear-powered, but not nuclear-armed, submarines. Australia had originally asked France to help modernise its submarines, but that deal's now dead. It's not yet clear how the work will be shared, but Britain hopes it'll boost its defence industry. BAE Systems already builds the Royal Navy's submarines and Rolls-Royce the nuclear reactors. Though British officials insist this defence partnership is not a response to any one country, but about stability and security in the Indo-Pacific, it will not be welcomed by China. Jonathan Beale, BBC News. The UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace said Australia's move wasn't about antagonising anyone. China is embarking on one of the biggest military spends and military uh, investments uh, in history. It is growing its Navy, Air Force at a huge rate, extremely fast. Uh, obviously, it is engaged in some controversial areas and disputed areas we've seen in the South China Seas and obviously the Taiwan Strait are areas that we often see in our media uh, where there is uh, stress. There, China is also in dispute with some of its neighbours like Vietnam and Philippines on fishing grounds, etc. So, so we've seen that. That is, that is China. That's what they're doing at the moment. And, you know, it, it's right that the United Kingdom, alongside other allies such as Australia, stand up for the rules-based system and the international law. And that's why we don't recognise some of the claims made about parts of the South China Sea. We, we, we uphold UNCLOS, the, United, the UN uh, a convention of freedom of the sea and make sure we, we stand by that. And so I think that that's where we are with China. But China is a global power. That's the reality of it. Uh, and we have to work with China uh, to, to, to point out where we think things are unacceptable, such as Uyghur or Hong Kong and human rights, but also recognise the simple reality of them as a very large economy. And we need to make sure we are uh, protected from an abuse of that if that were to occur. Ben Wallace. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent, Steve McDonald, who is in Beijing. Steve, hello to you. So what's the reaction from China? How does it view this alliance? Well, Chinese government has just held a press conference and Foreign Ministry spokesman Jia Li Jian has expressed outrage at this new military pact. He had especially strong words for Australia following the decision by Australia to build new nuclear-powered submarines. He said that uh, the international community, including neighbouring countries, had reason to question Australia's sincerity. But in terms of all three governments, he said that they had undermined regional peace and stability, intensified the arms race, that China would be paying very close attention to the developments following this new agreement, that these three governments should abandon what he said was an outdated Cold War zero-sum mentality, otherwise they would only shoot themselves in the foot. So some strong language there from Beijing, obviously not happy at this development. And what does this do to the power balance in the region? Talk to us a little bit about the, the geography, if you like. Well, you know, having uh, a country in the Asia-Pacific with these nuclear-powered submarines. Australia has also said, by the way, it's going to buy Tomahawk missiles, long-range missiles as well. It really strengthens Australia's military presence in the area. These submarines, nuclear-powered submarines, can stay underwater for a very long time and are especially lethal. You know, the incredible thing, in a way, is to see the speed with which China's relations with countries like Australia has collapsed in recent times. I mean, just a few years ago, Xi Jinping was in Australia watching football games and with a scarf around his neck, you know, cheering in the crowd, going to see uh, Aboriginal cave paintings and the like. In, in the space of just a couple of years, we now have Australia building nuclear armed submarines because of fears that its number one trading partner will threaten the region. So I think this has been a bit of a failure of China's 
so-called soft power. It, it seems to have disappeared altogether when you look at the complete collapse in relations between Beijing and other major countries in the Asia Pacific. Steve, thank you very much. Steve McDonnell in Beijing. And we're joined now by Tobias Elwood, Conservative MP and Chair of the Commons <coughs> Defence Select Committee. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, people waking up this morning and seeing this story might wonder, people here in the UK, what difference it makes to them. Does it make them more secure? Your thoughts on that, first of all, please. No, the world is certainly getting more insecure and getting more dangerous, and we need to wake up. Uh, to that. We, I think, have been in denial about where China is going over the last decade. They do not share our values. They do exploit uh, our inability to enforce international laws and standards. And the world, I'm afraid, is splitting into two spheres of influence, with China using its One Belt, One Road programs, its technology uh, and its uh, military capabilities to ensnare countries into its way of thinking. And what we're seeing now Finally, is the West waking up to that and this new strategic approach in the maritime space, bringing together trusted allies uh, to develop a more robust, hard power posture, specifically in the South China Sea, where China has made huge claims uh, over the uh, over the, uh, the waters there. Uh, you will have heard the reaction from China calling this uh, a Cold War zero-sum men mentality which undermines regional peace and stability. Uh, rhetoric substantially from China or, or, or something else? Of course, this is going to be their uh, immediate response. But let's not forget what China is doing. It is developing the largest navy in the world. Its navy advances in size, the size of our navy every single year. Now, to what end are they doing this? Their army is also the biggest in the world, and they're developing their air force and space weapon systems as well. And yet all this is happening. We've been watching. We don't have a, a unified international strategy as to how to deal with China, which in our lifetimes, militarily, economically, and technologically, is going to challenge the United States' dominance. So there are some big questions for the international community as to how we respond. Yeah, but I mean, initially, the and scale most critically, of... that includes protecting the South China Sea and keeping those seas open. Yeah, so, so giving Australia these nuclear-powered subs and, and uh, you know, I must emphasise, not armed with nuclear weapons, but nuclear-powered, uh, what does that do to address the scale of the challenge that you've just outlined from China? Well, it's, it's a first step. But like I said, there needs to be a wider strategy in how we deal with China's trade. There needs to be a, a counterweight to the One Belt, One Road program and some of the, the, the debt traps that China pushes forward. But immediately, from a hard power pers perspective, this is challenging uh, China's claim, this 9.9 claim to the South China Sea itself, which is so critical for international trade. So I'm pleased to see we're stepping forward. But let's not forget you know, two things here. Firstly, NATO is bruised after Afghanistan. There's some regrouping there as to what the purpose is of NATO beyond the P5 and this alliance as well. And secondly, if we are going to tilt to the Indo-Pacific like this, our Navy is overstretched. The 2% budget uh, will not accommodate this. We need to recognize that we need to increase our de defense spending because we're now at constant conflict. And so we need to spend at least 3% GDP on defense. How does it, this fit in with the Prime Minister's uh, ambitions for global Britain? How does it fit in with the, uh, the, the new relationship between the UK and the EU? Because the EU was about to announce its strategy for the Indo-Pacific region. And we know, of course, that France will be disappointed by its loss of the contract to supply Australia with new subs. No, you're absolutely right to raise these questions. And I hope at the UN Security Council, when all the leaders will be getting together, some of these can be uh, re reconciled. But what global Britain means, what are our ambitions on the international stage? You know, the West has become too risk averse. That's given space to authoritarian regimes such as China to, to rise in the way they've done. Our international rules and standards are no longer enforced. And we've actually seen the US retreat from global exposure as well. So there's a void in Western leadership right now, an opportunity for Britain to step forward, should we wish. Uh, and, to, you know, in defending uh, the ever-challenged uh, international rules-based order, uh, which I'm afraid are eroding. So we have a bumpy couple of decades ahead of us. We need to regroup. Uh, in a line, uh, if you would, the cabinet reshuffle. Um, is this a levelled-up cabinet or not? And is this the cabinet, do you think, that will take the Conservatives into the next election? Well, I certainly hope that is the case, but I make it clear from where I stand, all the things that we've been speaking about, you know, uh, COVID and the Afghan evacuation 
showed how siloed our government system continues to work. So uh, there is a strong argument, not just to refresh the team, but to shake up the Whitehall setup itself, how departments actually interact with each other, how strategies are formed, how they're implemented, how decisions are made, and how we can actually develop a greater appetite to do what we've done in the past, which is offer the statecraft that's now required. Tobias Elwood, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Now, today is the final day for care home staff in England to receive their first dose of a coronavirus vaccine if they want to keep their job. It comes after MPs voted in favour of requiring all care workers in a Care Quality Commission registered care home to be fully vaccinated by the 11th of November unless they have a medical exemption. We'll have more on this story later. And uh, if you work in a care home or you are a resident in one or have a relative in one and would like to get in touch with us about this and tell us what you think about this mandatory uh, vaccination idea you can do that on twitter at anita underscore mcveigh and you can use the hashtag bbc your questions Poor quality housing in England is causing thousands of deaths every year, according to a new report from the Centre for Ageing Better. The charity has called on the government to give more attention to the millions of homes falling below decent living standards. The Ministry of Housing says it's working hard to improve the quality of homes across England. Let's return now to the Prime Minister's shake-up of his government and we can go to Downing Street and talk to our chief political correspondent, Adam Fleming. So, Adam, how much business remains to be done today on that reshuffle? Uh, quite a lot, but it's not necessarily household names because the phase the reshuffle has entered now is the ranks below the cabinet. So ministers of state and below, and that started last night. Uh, we've had a few names this morning. Penny Mordaunt is moving from the cabinet office to the Department for International Trade. Now that means though, as things stand at the moment, all the international jobs in the government are going to be done by women, whether it's at the Foreign Office or the Department for International Trade. That may change throughout the morning, but one of the messages that the government wants you to get from this reshuffle is that lots of women have been appointed. The other big message is the D word, delivery. They want us to think that this is a bunch of people who are good at getting things done. So, for example, Michael Gove going to the Communities Department, that means he will be in charge of delivering, levelling up and building a lot more houses. Nadeem Zahawi going from being Vaccines Minister to Education Secretary means he will be in charge of delivering all that catching up that is required in schools after the pandemic. Yeah, one um, Downing, former Downing Street insider I spoke to earlier said uh, there are reformers in this cabinet now because of the reshuffle, but will they be allowed to do that uh, reforming? And, and I guess budgets come into this. Will there be money to do what they want? Well, and also that's another intriguing thing about this reshuffle that shows in politics personnel always comes before process because on the 27th of October, just a few weeks away, we're going to have a spending review where the government allocates all the money for the next three years to each individual government department. That is overseen by the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. It is basically the biggest thing a Chief Secretary to the Treasury can do in that job. Well, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury yesterday, Steve Barclay, is now uh, the Minister for the Cabinet Office and he's been replaced by Simon Clark just a few weeks before that process gets underway. Which just makes you realize sometimes putting the right people in the right jobs to suit the politics sometimes takes precedence over uh, actually the contents of the job. Okay, Adam, thank you very much. Adam Fleming in Downing Street. Well, uh, Michael Gove has been appointed as Community Secretary after Robert Jenrick was sacked in yesterday's cabinet reshuffle. With me now to talk about uh, what Mr. Gove might do is Topsy Taiwo. He's the uh, presenter and founder of the property advice platform property purchaser. Uh, Topsy, great to have you with us. And, and talking about the big picture, first of all, what are the biggest challenges uh, on housing as you see it for Michael Gove? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. L let's just say that the new housing minister's definitely got his work cut out for him. I mean, wh where do I start? Planning reform, building targets, building safety, affordable homes, green homes, the, the list really goes on. But I think one thing that the cabinet and the new minister has to do is really instill a sense that the government truly cares about housing reform. We've had nine housing ministers since the office was given cabinet level recognitions in, in 2005. And that just doesn't really suggest that it's a department that the government truly cares about. So I think the first major challenge is to ensure that they really care about reform and they are going to stick to their promise, promises and not just give lip service on what they're saying they're going to do and make sure that the action actually matches up with the rhetoric.
OK, well, you know, we hear all the time about levelling up, don't we? And, and we've heard it a lot yesterday and today already. I know that you're passionate about helping the black community to get on the property ladder. And you see that, don't you, uh, as part of the levelling up agenda. What do the statistics say about home ownership among black people? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a clear issue that home ownership amongst the black community in this country is far below our, our white counterparts. And it's a well-known stat that home ownership rates amongst black people in this country are around 30 percent. And once you segment that down into Africans, it's actually 20 percent. And when you compare that to our white counterparts, that home ownership rate sits at around 60 percent. So there's certainly a bit of work that we can do to ensure that the community has high home ownership rates. We can increase financial education and property knowledge. But the, the low home ownership rates for me really stem from much wider systemic inequality, uh, much wider systemic inequality. And I think home ownership is inextricably linked and tied to wages and income. So I think a more effective way to look at it and address the issue is actually to look at trying to close the racial and gender pay, pay gap that, that sits within, within the black community, especially. So when you talk about systemic inequalities, that is why uh, I presume you're saying that you see this very much as part of the levelling up agenda. It's not just about a geographical levelling up of regions, but it's about much more than that. Uh, absolutely. You know, when you look at how a mortgage is granted, it's a multiple of your income. And when you also think about generational wealth, a lot of families are able to pass down that generation well to their to their to their counterparts and to their families and relatives and that's not been able to happen within the black community so i think a big thing that we can do is really to try and address that issue from a top-down approach increase policies that are going to make sure that, that gender pay, pay gap and racial pay gap is closed as much as possible it's only then that we'll start to address the issue of home ownership rates amongst the black community in this country i just wonder um, topsy if i could get your thoughts on uh, another of our housing stories today which is that poor quality housing in england is causing thousands of deaths every year um so how do you want um, you know michael gove to address all of these issues and and, and things like this that we're hearing from the Centre for Ageing Better. Uh, what specifically would you like to see him do in this new role? Yeah, it's a great question. And we always hear that house building target of 300,000 homes a year, but it's, it's never really reached. But I think a bigger question is to actually increase the quality of homes, but also to make sure that they're affordable. Lots of people who end up being priced out of the market have to suffer from you know inadequate landlords who aren't providing accurate um, proper housing for them and they suffer from that poor quality of housing so i think a big thing that michael gove can do is to increase regulatory standards to make sure landlords landlords are keeping to that standard but also to provide homes that are affordable eco-friendly and are going to are going to keep them safe we've seen things like the cladding issue we've all watched programs on tv where you see nightmare landlords and nightmare tenants it just doesn't bode very well when you're looking at that so i think one thing we can definitely do is to increase regulation but also to make sure that government is injecting more money, not just to hit the housing target, but also to increase the quality of housing that is actually delivered in, in the first place. OK, uh, Topsy, thank you very much for your thoughts this morning. Uh, Topsy okay. Taiwo there from Property Purchaser. A British woman found guilty of lying about an attack whilst on holiday in Cyprus is hoping to have her conviction overturned when the case goes before the country's Supreme Court later. The unnamed woman told police she had been raped by a group of 12 Israeli men in Ayanapa two years ago before retracting the allegation. Her lawyers have described her conviction as unsafe. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle have been named icons in Time magazine's annual list of the world's 100 most influential people. It marks the first time the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have posed together formally for a magazine cover shoot. Other special edition covers of the magazine include singer Billie Eilish and Olympic gymnast Simone Biles. OK, it is time for a look at the weather forecast. Uh, let's get all the latest with Matt Taylor. Hi there, Matt. Hi there, Anita. Very good morning. Tip us too next year. Don't you worry, Anita. But uh, let's start with a quick look across the east coast of England. This was Scarborough this morning as the sun came up, shaping up to be a lovely September's day across uh, much of the UK. There is still one or two showers. Well, not one or two showers. Eastern parts of Scotland, far northeast of England. They will clear in the next hour or so. Mist and fog patches clearing too. And then sunny spells for much of England, Wales, eastern Scotland. Western Scotland, Northern Ireland, though, progressively cloudier through the afternoon. Grey skies for Northern Ireland, maybe towards the Western Isles as well. Could just start to see some rain fringing here by the end of the afternoon evening. But much of this afternoon evening will be dry across Scotland. Best of the sunshine lasting in the east. Temperatures into the high teens. It'll still be in the high teens in Northern Ireland, but rain not quite with you in Belfast by five o'clock, but it will be far away by then. Much of England, Wales, all stays dry. Good sunny spells and uh, temperatures 
widely into the low 20s. A good 340 degrees above where we should be for the time of year. And with light winds, it really will feel quite pleasant out there. Bit more of a breeze out towards the west, and that's because we've got that weather front bringing some rain at times into the night across Northern Ireland, Scotland, also for Cumbria and Northumberland. Much of England Wales will be dry, clear skies with some mist and fog patches around, and it won't be a desperately cold start to tomorrow morning. But the rain in the west will be sitting there much of Friday. Eastern areas staying dry. A few more showers around this weekend. Bye for now. Hello, this is BBC News with me, Anita McVeigh. The headlines for you at exactly half past nine. The Prime Minister is expected to announce more ministerial appointments in the biggest shake-up of his government since he entered Downing Street. Britain, the United States and Australia have agreed a new defence and security partnership to counter China's growing military presence. China calls it irresponsible. Today is the deadline for care staff or volunteers who work in residential and nursing homes in England to have their first dose of the COVID vaccine. Most workers say they'd rather not return to their offices full time, according to new research, and more than a fifth would like to work from home for good. Four amateur astronauts have blasted off from Florida on their private mission to orbit the Earth for the next three days. It is time for sport. Let's head to the BBC Sports Centre. Mike Bushell is there. Morning to you, Mike. Good morning. And last night's football was pretty much out of this world, you know, Anita. So often the opening matches of the Champions League group stage have been cautious, cagey, sometimes boring affairs, but not last night when it was raining goals, including at Anfield, where Liverpool staged a second half fight back to beat the Italian side AC Milan, while Manchester City beat RB Leipzig in a nine goal thriller at the Etihad. Our sports correspondent, Natalie Perks, was watching. The Liverpool faithful finally back for European nights at Anfield. Absence certainly makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> AC Milan have had an absence of their own though, seven years out of the Champions League till now, but it looked like it was going to be a baptism of fire with an early own goal. It could have got worse, but Mo Salah missed a chance to double Liverpool's lead. And it's saved. And it was a let-off that let Milan back in the game. In it goes now to Rebic, and then With Klopp left scratching his head, Liverpool's dominance soon gave way to downright sloppiness. A half-time pep talk was needed. It clearly worked. First Salah, then Hallo, Jordan Henderson, to complete another memorable comeback against Milan. 3-2, the final score. It was a brilliant game, very exciting, I think very entertaining. Um, with 10-15 minutes where we lost a little bit uh, the plot or whatever. In a moment like this, obviously the game can be decided, but not tonight because we could adjust in the half time and um, did that. Um, played again, really good football and um, scored two wonderful goals and um, so won the, won the game. Manchester City came so close to landing the trophy its owners covet the most last season and then Naki got moffed for dream start against Leipzig. But the game caught fire and at 3-2, Jack Grealish showed just why City paid a record fee for him. A hat-trick for Leipzig's Unkunku made it 4-3, but late goals for Cancelo and Jesus made it 6-3 City on a captivating night in the Champions League. Natalie Perks, BBC News. Yeah, so a great night for Man City and in particular Jack Grealish, wasn't it? And after the game, City's manager Pep Guardiola promised that this was just the start of things to come. Hopefully it can be the first of many. Uh, I had the feeling that every day, every day is, uh, is playing better in many things and I'm pretty sure they will be better in the in the future and uh, yeah his contribution was again high was good and delight for his game now we may only be seven games into the new championship season but nottingham forest are now looking for a new manager after just 11 months in charge manager chris hewton has been sacked this morning forest are bottom of the league with just one point from their first seven games that's their worst start to a season for 108 years Four times world champion Sebastian Vettel and Canadian Lance Stroll, son of the owner, will race for Aston Martin again next season in an unchanged driver lineup. Vettel won four Formula One world championships in a row with Red Bull between uh, 2010 and 2013. 
Executive Chairman Lawrence Stroll said he was delighted to be continuing with such an excellent blend of youthful talent and experienced expertise. Now, the world's most high-profile gymnast, Simone Biles, has given an emotional testimony before the Senate about abuse she has suffered at the hands of disgraced former team doctor Larry Nazar. Former teammates also appeared before the committee along with the FBI director, Christopher Wray. The hearing is looking at shortcomings in the FBI's investigation into Nazar, who was later convicted of sexually abusing girls and sentenced to life in prison. I don't want another young gymnast, Olympic athlete, or any individual to experience the horror that I and hundreds of others have endured before, during, and continuing to this day in the wake of the Larry Nassar abuse. To be clear, I blame Larry Nassar, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. Simone Biles there showing incredible strength in that hearing. Now, Mo Farah's former coach, Alberto Salazar, will have to serve the whole of his four-year ban after losing his appeal in the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Salazar was banned for a series of doping violations by the US Anti-Doping Agency two years ago and appealed the decision. Salazar ran the Nike Oregon project, which was the training base of Mo Farah. Farah, though, has not been accused of doping and left the setup back in 2017. Yeah, the appeal was actually on Zoom back in March, but the results are now out and known. And so we'll serve the whole of that band. That's all the sport for now, though. Back to you, Anita. Mike, thank you very much. As we've been hearing, today is the final day for care home staff in England to receive their first dose of a coronavirus vaccine if they want to keep their jobs. MPs voted in favour of requiring all care workers to be fully vaccinated by the 11th of November unless medically exempt. Well, this is what one care home worker in Scarborough thinks of the policy. Well, I'm happy to have had it done, but those people who choose not to are going to lose their jobs because they're scared. Why should they have to lose their jobs because the care homes have to have it done and other sectors aren't? I think. Well, uh, let's speak now to Neil Russell, who is chairman of PJ Care, a provider of specialist neurological care and neuro rehabilitation. Uh, it's facing the loss of 10 percent of the 250 highly trained staff it employs at its Eaglewood Centre in Peterborough. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Neil. And uh, at the time of uh, Speaking, is that still the case? Are we talking about roughly 10% of your staff not wanting to have the vaccine? Um, it, we're, the numbers are dropping. Uh, the numbers are dropping every day. So uh, we're, we're hoping we're going to get it down to around 6 or 7%. Uh, uh, and and what are they saying to you about their reasons for not wanting the vaccination? They, they vary massively. Um, we, we have some people who have very strong religious beliefs um, that we're not going to be able to overcome. Uh, a, a fair proportion of those who don't want to be vaccinated are quite simply frightened. They're scared. Uh, they don't understand. They spend a lot of time on social media reading all the scare stories. Um, and, and we're having to try and re-educate and overcome that. With a lot of them, we're, we're just not going to be successful. Um, the fact that it's been made mandatory has, has made it worse for some of them because they're thinking, well, if it's safe, why do you have to force me to have it? Mm, interesting to hear those perspectives. Uh, and I know in your efforts to, because you have long-standing relationships with many of these members of staff, the patients do, and you want to retain as many of them as possible. So you've actually brought a, a vaccine bus to the care home, haven't you? Has that, has that persuaded more people, literally parking the bus outside the care home, persuading people to, to, to have the vaccine? It did. That was really useful. We, I mean, it was with us for a couple of hours. And in that time, we managed to get another 10 staff vaccinated. Those who are on duty. Um, we, we encouraged those who hadn't been vaccinated to go and talk to the uh, NHS staff on the bus um, to understand and, and overcome their fears and their concerns. And it worked for, uh, for the majority. And we got another 10 staff vaccinated. So it was successful. Uh, and I believe um, you've uh, also offered a car as a prize in a raffle to fully vaccinated staff. I mean, you're really going to quite some lengths here, aren't you? We're, we're doing everything we can to uh, keep keep the staff. Um, we're a specialist care provider. Our staff are very highly trained. Um, we've invested massively in them and, and our residents love them. Yeah, yeah so we, it's, we it's not people... going to be easy to replace them from a skills point no. of view, from that relationship point of view. Um, when you get to the 
well, today is the deadline for that first vaccination if they're going to be fully vaccinated by the 11th of November. If you lose a percentage of your staff, how difficult is that going to be in terms of the day-to-day -day operation running of the home? Uh, and uh, how difficult will it be to replace them? Um, in terms of running the home, um, we'll, we'll be okay, we'll cope. Um, we, we had 120 staff in isolation uh, at a point last year and, and we managed to get through that it's go, it's going to affect the, the the niceties of the care we provide our residents will remain safe we, we can ensure that but but some of the extra the bits that give them give our residents a really good quality of life that's going to be affected in terms of replacing staff recruitment in the sector is is very difficult um you know uh, two years ago the care sector had over a hundred thousand vacancies and now we're adding another 6%, 7% of the uh, care sector on top of that, so another 40, 50,000 people. So replacing um, staff is going to be a challenge. We've just invested uh, a huge amount of money in a massive recruitment campaign. We've ups um, and we're gonna have to train everybody as well. So there's those training costs on top of, so bringing somebody in, it's gonna be six months yeah. until we're um, sort of back to, to where we are today with highly skilled professional caring staff. Uh, we're seeing that the Department of Health and Social Care has um, uh, allowed for a medical exemption for care home workers. They have to get a certificate from a doctor saying they're medically exempt. But I, as I understand it, it's for a temporary period only. I mean, I I is that any use to you? Uh, well, uh, what do you make of that? Um, we're not quite sure. This landed on a desk about lunchtime yesterday, the day before um and and it's quite confusing so the and, and actually it's the self-certification they don't even have to get anything from their doctor so they can get uh 12 weeks uh uh extension if you like on their um on, on their pit time at work from a an unknown date in the future when the so uh department of health produces a covid pass and they sign the, and they they sign for themselves to self-certify their exemption so would you be comfortable if, if the majority of your staff have been fully vaccinated but a small proportion are self-certifying would you be comfortable with that would the the residents and, and their relatives be comfortable with that um well yes because at the moment uh those staff are, are working caring for the relatives we've got some very strong infection control we wear masks we've got aprons gloves everything we're doing um is ensuring the safety of our residents and we haven't had a uh, positive case amongst our residents for some considerable time even though we've had members of staff who have tested positive so it's not being transmitted at the moment what we're doing now with unvaccinated staff is working is keeping our residents safe OK, uh, really good to get your thoughts today. Neil Russell, chairman of PJ Care, thank you very much. And let's bring in now Charlie uh, O'Doherty, who is a care home worker from Bristol, who has had both vaccinations. Uh, Charlie, thanks for joining us. Uh, w was that a straightforward decision for you to have the vaccinations? Um, it was not it wasn't. Oh, there, was a, there was an initial period where I thought, is this the right thing to do for me as a person, for my body? Uh, but then quite quickly, I just thought, no, if I want to work in this environment, I'm going to have to be able to make sure I, I'm protected first to be able to protect the people around me. Uh, and your colleagues, what's the, the, the view among them? Have most of them been vaccinated or not? The vast majority, yes. There was um, one or two of the younger girls were a little bit reticent as they were wanting to plan families and they weren't too sure as the uh what the the, the vaccine would uh, the effect it would have on them um uh but they've now gone ahead and they've had it and i only know of one person that has not had the vaccine who works in that environment and obviously at, at the end of um in, in november they'll have to move on to another job do you think it's reasonable or not given your profession that you are being required that it is mandatory for you to have the vaccination i don't i don't find it unreasonable at all I don't find it unreasonable at all. You know, people go into different uh, work environments and there's certain criteria that they have to make uh, a day or two to, to, to join that uh, establishment. And this is just one of the things that we have to do now to protect the, uh, the, the residents. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a straightforward calculation for you. And, and what sort of reaction have you got? As I'm sure you, know, you chat to the relatives of residents in the care home and, and residents themselves, what sort of reaction have you got from them uh, to this idea of the mandatory vaccinations? Do they feel much more comfortable or would, th would they be supportive of the idea of some people not wanting to have the vaccination? 
it's that's a difficult one because they don't tend to talk to you about it you know i mean everyone has their own personal opinion on what they want to do in one way or another but it, on the whole um staff and residents are you know uh they're they, they, they're, they're quite happy for it but you know the trouble is <laughs> In the care environment now, there's a severe lack of staff, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of people that work in that environment, you know, they they care about their job and they care about the people around them. So they're not, you know, if they need to take that job to be able to stay there and help these people, then they they you know they probably will do. Charlie, great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time today. Charlie O'Doherty, a care home worker from Bristol. Let me bring in a couple of your comments on this story. Liz Rose says, uh, my mother, who's 82, has been in two care homes since January and both have had COVID brought in by staff and have had to lock down. My mother was infected on one occasion, but luckily, as she was recently immunised, she had almost uh, no symptoms. Um, this one from uh, Jodal, who says, uh, I believe correct information is key, but there's been plenty of time to work at with those who don't want to be vaccinated and provide the assurances they need at some point you have to say unless you have a medical reason for not having it you can't work with vulnerable people and uh yeah this from ken mclean who says if a healthcare worker refuses the vaccine and gives a resident the virus and the resident dies as a result then they should be prosecuted under the health and safety at at work act uh, do keep your thoughts coming in you can do that on twitter at anita underscore mcveigh and use the hashtag bbc your questions the first space mission in history to be crewed entirely by amateur astronauts has taken off from Florida. The four civilians on board include a healthcare worker, a scientist and a data analyst and a billionaire. They'll spend the next three days circling Earth. Our North America correspondent David Willis has more. After months of rigorous training, it was time to slip into the custom-made spacesuits and make their way to the launch pad for a milestone flight into orbit. A trip funded by billionaire businessman Jared Isaacman to raise funds for charity. The crew also includes Cyan Proctor, the first black woman to pilot a spacecraft, as well as 29-year-old cancer survivor Haley Arsenault. I definitely am excited to represent those that aren't physically perfect. I want to bring this experience back and share with, with everyone I encounter and just what this represents for the, the new age in space travel and, and who can be an astronaut. After being helped into their seats by the ground crew, it was time for liftoff, a remotely controlled space capsule atop a reusable SpaceX rocket powering into orbit from Florida's famous Kennedy Space Center, destined to transport the quartet of amateur space travelers deeper than the International Space Station. SpaceX is hoping to schedule flights like this around six times a year. After circling the globe once every 90 minutes at a speed of roughly 17,000 miles an hour, the craft is expected to touch down off the coast of Florida in three days' time. David Willis, BBC News, Los Angeles. Let's talk now to Dr. Becky Smithhurst, who's an astrophysicist at Oxford University. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about uh, the Inspiration4. Um, so what do we know about what they're going to be doing? Um, well, they're space tourists, but will they be doing any experiments up there? Yeah, I think amateur astronaut might be a sort of a better word to give these uh, four people because, you know, unlike sort of Branson and Bezos, who just went up for couple of minutes, maybe to about 50 miles altitude. These guys are going up to 350 miles in altitude. That's higher than the International Space Station flies. And my first question was, what are they going to be doing for three days? Are they just going to be looking through the windows down on Earth? But they are doing scientific experiments while they're up there. So specifically looking at how microgravity affects the human body, spaceflight affecting the human body, sort of tracking their sleep, taking blood, doing ultrasounds as well, which is very exciting, and, and conducting all those experiments as amateur astronauts while the craft is piloted from the ground. And, and those will help with, you know, if we are planning on a future mission to Mars, maybe a human base on Mars, then that will help with us understanding how spaceflight might affect the human body if you're in space for an extended time. But also you can imagine how maybe some treatments here on Earth, you know, we might be able to figure out some breakthrough by looking at how they work in microgravity as well. How innovative 
is this trip? Uh, how exciting is it? And I know I used the words, the word space tourism before, but uh, are we looking here at the advent of more space tourism rather than uh, amateur astronauts going into space or actual astronauts? Yeah, I mean, I think we really have sort of cracked the door open into that realm where maybe anyone could go in because, you know, um, previously NASA and the European Space Agency, they've been sort of the gatekeepers for astronauts, right? You had to pass all the rigorous testing. It was incredibly competitive. You usually had to have a PhD or, or some Air Force uh, experience as, as a military pilot, something like that. We've seen sort of not just space tourism recently, you know, with billionaires going into space, but in fact, the first Britain to go into space was Helen Sharman back in the 90s, in 1991. And you could say that she was sort of, you know, a space tourist, if you will, because she wasn't a professional astronaut. She went up to the, the Mir space station for eight days. Here, we're sort of maybe seeing now that space agencies don't really have a monopoly on this, you know, maybe commercial companies, SpaceX doing six flights like this a year where, okay, yeah, okay, a billionaire has, has booked all these seats that usually NASA pays about 55 million quid for, sorry, $55 million for, uh, you know, per seat on these crafts. But like, if they're raffled off to people like this one was in sort of a competition to raise money for charity, it could definitely open the door for more people and also um, follow ESAs, the European, European Space Agency's recent um, call for astronauts, which said, you don't have to be peak physical fitness. We're to take anybody and we're going to adapt our spacesuits and the international space station for you because space should, should should be available to everybody and i think you know so we're cracking the door for lots of different people now to to maybe broaden who gets to go into space uh, really uh, good to talk to you uh, dr becky smithhurst there astrophysicist at oxford university thank you very much now, most workers do not believe people will fully return to the office after the coronavirus pandemic. An exclusive survey for the BBC suggests about 70 percent of those polled predicted that people would never return to offices at the same rate. The majority said that they would prefer to work from home, either full time or at least some of the time. But bosses raised concerns that creativity in the workplace would be affected. Well, our business correspondent Ramzan Karmali is here with me to talk more about this. So uh, are we essentially looking at the new New normal now. I mean, I know bosses have some concerns, but will the workers prevail? It does. It does sort of feel like that. I just, just to pick up on something you just said. You said the majority of us think that we're going to be ending end up working at home either part time or full time. In fact, around a fifth of people think they're going to be working at home full time. So that's a quite a large chunk of people, and about two fifths think think it will be part time. So people are looking at this sort of hybrid type of working. Um, and don't forget, the prime minister said he does recommend a gradual return to work. His own scientific advisors, though, are saying we should try and minimise contact still. So there is a, a, a fine balancing act to, to, to sort of walk here. And uh, one business that's been doing that is the Yorkshire Building Society. And we can speak to Tracy Newton, who's the director of Colleague Experience. Um, Tr Tracy, how has this pandemic changed how and where staff at the Yorkshire Building Society have been working? Um, it has had quite a profound impact in terms of how we've been working. Now, when we went into... Um, the pandemic, we had two key priorities that really guided the way that we've looked at how we operate. And that's been about maintaining the health and well-being of all of our colleagues and continuing to serve our customers that need us most. Um, so in this context, the pandemic has really impacted our colleagues in a number of different ways because um, we have a number of different groups of colleagues in the organisation. We've had a big chunk of individuals who've continued to work in branches so they've been out there supporting the public day to day. So for those guys, the impact has more been about um, how they work as a consequence of the pandemic and the restrictions that, that that brought with it in terms of social distancing. And for a period of time, we actually reduced our branch opening hours, which was about reflecting kind of customer demand and how customers were operating. And that group of individuals kind of switched to more phone based work to support um, Due to technology challenges, we've also had a large population of colleagues in our operational teams and contact centres, and they've continued to come into the office throughout the whole of the pandemic. Now, for those, the impact has been around the flexibility and the type of work that those guys have been doing. They've been working across teams to make sure that they can support colleagues who are out of the business, but also our customers with their very specific needs through the pandemic. So for those, flexibility has come in a different form. And like many other organisations, we've had a huge amount of people who switched almost overnight from working in office full time to working from home. Um, so in March last year, um, 1,400 colleagues 
left the office and didn't come back for quite a while. And they've been predominantly working from home um, and they've been really adapting to different ways of operating. So, sure. so we've always been a pretty flexible employer at YBS, but I would say the pandemic has, a, has taken it to another level for us. So, so Tracy, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of organisation here that you guys have got to do. I mean, you've got people working at, at home full time. You've got people doing a bit of both and people in the office. How does a, how does a business like yourself deal with that organisation of actually managing to to put these people in different boxes, so to speak? I think we've we've it's not necessarily been around putting people in boxes to some extent. We've looked at what's the nature of work that individuals are doing. What do we need them to do to support their customer? And then really balance that need in terms of how they operate. So some of that's been very much role driven. So if you're in a branch, you have to be in a space where you're face to face with a customer. So how do we lean into that and create flexibility there? If you're in a contact center and you need access to particular technology to support customers, that again is place limitations. So I think some of the box creation has almost been very much driven by the type of work that individuals are, in do are doing and then the best and most productive and safe way through a pandemic by which they can they can execute that. I think I know the answer to this next question I'm going to ask you. The way you're working now, do you see that as possibly the model going forward for the next five, ten years? I, I think we probably see a variation. I mean, what I would say is that, you know, we... The, the, the learnings that we've had over the last year have really opened up the conversation about what can work look like going forward. And it's really tested us in terms of what the possible is in terms of how we work. Um, and college ex expectations have changed during this period, and we really need to respect that. So for us, like many organisations, we haven't seen productivity dip as a result in our change of way of working. Rather, for those that are home working, the challenge is often how we get them to switch off at the end of the day. Um, and we've done a really good job over the last 18 months in terms of adapting how we work. The next step for us will be how do we optimise the opportunities that hybrid working brings us? And they'll be different for different groups. The big conversation we're having at YBS is that hybrid working isn't about home working per se. It's about how do we use technology that really allows us to Tra connect our colleagues to the customer and give them some really great opportunities Tra in how they Tracy. work moving forward. Tracy, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're running out of time. But Tracy Newson, uh, Director of Colleague Experience at Yorkshire Building Society, many thanks for your time. And Anita, that's the business for you. Ramzan, uh, you. I think more on that story soon. Definitely. Yeah. Um, now, people in Finland have a new way to let off some steam. <laughs> That's definitely letting off steam. A room in the Finnish capital where you can vent your anger is proving a big hit, especially among women. The Helsinki Rage Room was founded by an ex-convict who wanted people to have a safe space to release their pandemic-era frustrations. The founder says 80% of his customers are women aged between 25 and 45. OK, it is time for a look at the weather with Matt Taylor. Matt, hopefully feeling no frustrations with the weather this morning. <laughs> We've all been there, though, Anita, and I'm looking at you, Mr. Weather Computer, but uh, we're all on form this morning. Uh, weather's not too bad either, but look at this. It's going to be a rare sight today. A beautiful shot of a rainbow from one of our weather watchers in the Highlands. One or two showers have been pushing their way eastwards. It's not typical, though, because for most, it's going to be a day like this with some blue skies overhead. Lovely mid-September's day for the vast majority. The Will be some changes though as we go through into the afternoon and we're talking about this area cloud pushing off the Atlantic at the moment creeping towards Northern Ireland and Western Scotland so getting progressively cloudy here after some morning sunshine and a few more spots of rain will arrive. The showers that we've seen across Northern Scotland clearing from the east clearing away from North East England too where we have one or two earlier on but much of Scotland England and Wales having a dry day with some good long spells of sunshine before that rain arrives in towards Northern Ireland as we go through the second half of the day. Temperatures today around uh, 3, 4 degrees above where you should be for the time of year. 16 to 22 Celsius. Made to feel even warmer in light winds, of course, across parts of England, Wales and eastern Scotland. More of a breeze, though, to western Scotland, Northern Ireland, all linked into that approaching weather system, which will bring rain on and off tonight, Northern Ireland and eventually into parts of Scotland, particularly across the western half of the country. Maybe some rain, Cumbria and Northumberland too. Much of England and Wales, though, will be dry and with some lengthy clear skies. Guys here, there will be some mist and fog patches once more into tomorrow morning. Single figure temperatures in the countryside, most of those double figures. Again, pretty mild for this stage in September.
Now, the chart for uh, Friday shows this weather front, but notice just how slowly through the day it creeps its way eastwards. Energy along it rippling northwards instead of from west to east. So it's going to be a case of rain on and off in Northern Ireland, odd heavier bursts, same too in Western Scotland. We may just see that cloud thicken and some outbreaks of rain into the west of Wales, Cornwall, Isles of Scilly later on. But much of eastern Scotland, good part of England and Wales will stay dry through Friday. Winds a little bit fresher than today, coming up from a southerly direction, but the temperatures still every bit as high up into the low 20s, quite widely through England, Wales and South East Scotland. Then as we go through into the weekend, our weather front it pushes across the UK, but then just stops again. Things rippling along it rather than from west to east. So it's going to complicate the story a bit this weekend in exactly how much sunshine you'll see in any one particular area or how much rain there'll be. It does look like our weather front will bring some damp conditions out to the sort of Irish Sea, southwest, across some parts of uh, Scotland. But further east, most places will be dry on Sunday with some sunny spells and Saturday and a few showers to come on Sunday too. Bye for now.